Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, over the weekend, we saw some pretty spectacular imagery here of a prescribed fire near Tyndall Air Force Base in the panhandle of Florida. What was spectacular about it was it was producing pyrocumulus clouds, and we got lots of great imagery of these particular clouds. Take a look at this one from Jake here, just showing the pyrocumulus. I think he was viewing this from near Destin, Florida. In addition to that, take you up north here. This is uh, in Verdon, Manitoba. Destin Justin Freeman caught a pretty spectacular supercell here, producing this what appears to be very isolated tornado on the back side of this supercell. From there, I'm going to take you to the Twin Cities last night, the National Weather Service out of the Twin Cities, where Alexander reported some very large hail, some uh, baseball size and golf ball size hail. And the storm systems that did go through over the weekend in parts of Minnesota produced some very heavy rainfall and hail. As you can see here, looking back over the last 72 hours, there were places there in parts of the state of Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, but stretching in the surrounding states where some of these storms put down some very, very heavy rainfall. Now, this map is valid through 4 a.m. We're going to be seeing quite a bit more precipitation moving across parts of the Corn Belt as I get into the forecast here in a few moments. But come down to parts of Missouri, you can see some sections in there picking up four to five inches of rainfall. And on those stalled out boundaries over parts of the southeast, stretching up into parts of the mid-Atlantic, we did get some locally heavy rainfall over the weekend as well. Now, thinking about that hail, I'm going to show you a couple of things. This is the maximum estimated hail size from the MRMS uh, data product here, looking back over the last three days. We can see that some of those hailstones that were measured by radar here in parts of Minnesota were in the two to three inch diameter range. But there was also some pretty sizable hail that was back in parts of South Dakota as well. And the National Weather Service out of Rapid City retweeted a picture here from uh, Silver City, which is showing some extremely large hail. That's almost grapefruit sized hail. So it got me thinking about hail this year. And what I wanna show you first is that in the United States, currently 2020 ranks as the uh, slowest accumulation of hail reports in the U.S. In other words, compared to all previous years that we got data for here, this is the fewest number of hail reports we've seen across the country. I say that, but at the same time, many farming operations have been hammered this year. What I made here is a map that shows you the number of days with hail greater than half inch diameter going back to March 1st. So this is March 1st through the 8th of August. When you look at this map, the color coding is telling you the number of days where we've had hail bigger than a half inch. And you can see the high plains, there's a lot of locations in that have seen between four and upwards of seven or eight days, where at least half inch hailstones have fallen out of some of the storms. And I come right into that rapid city, you know, area coming into parts of Nebraska. And there's a corridor right in through here where some fields have been hit upwards of seven to 10 times uh, with hail bigger than a half inch so far this year. It seems to be this preferred corridor of, of severe weather uh, this year. Now from there, I'm going to talk about the main severe weather type I'm expecting not only today but throughout this week, and that's going to be from strong straight line winds. Currently, 2020 ranks third behind 2011 and 2008 in terms of the number of severe wind reports, and we are well above average uh, right now sitting at uh, around 12,600 reports of severe winds. You see, when the, we see the winds coming later today, they're going to be on this boundary right in through here. So there's a stationary front parked in that area, well, maybe a very mo slow moving cold front being fed on the south side by an abundant amount of Gulf moisture. And along that frontal boundary is where we're going to have to watch for the severe storms to kick off later today, plus along the outflow of some storms that are coming out of the Dakotas this morning. Meanwhile, go to parts of Canada. We're expecting a very windy week in through this corridor here that we're going to watch very carefully. And while it's so windy in that part of Canada, down here over the southeast, we're going to see lots of pop-up thunderstorms like we've been seeing, but the atmosphere is quite stagnant. And also, as you've probably noticed, we do have another tropical system to be discussing, but this one's in the East Pacific, and it is named Alida. All right. From there, let's get right on into the severe weather threat for today. Take a look at the map in the upper left-hand corner. Now, this is through the 4 a.m update from the Storm Prediction Center, we can see that they've highlighted a pretty sizable corridor in through here on which they are anticipating some severe weather today. Primary threat is going to be from straight line winds, just given the wind shear profile in the atmosphere. But if you take a look at our proprietary map down here at the bottom, this is our thunderstorm index, our severe thunderstorm index. We can see that if, if I were to redraw this, I might expand that area that I'm concerned about uh, a bit larger here uh, into parts of northern Illinois, uh, specifically than getting over into southern Michigan all the way down through the Ohio River Valley. As we go from today into tomorrow, we're going to watch the high plains and also what could be coming out of east 
southeastern uh, Oklahoma into parts of Arkansas. And then in the day on Wednesday, uh, we're going to be seeing this region here in parts of the north central plains. We're going to have to keep a close eye out on severe weather. I do expect the day two and day three maps to change quite a bit, though, as we watch the forecast evolve here in the near term. Now, where this heavy rain will be coming through could hit some critical fields. I'm specifically talking about parts of Minnesota, Iowa, northern Illinois, and southern Wisconsin. Over the last couple of weeks, you can see here that there is a pocket in that's been very, very dry. Also down in parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley, in parts of Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, getting into parts of Tennessee, there are pockets that are very, very dry, where in between it, we've seen some extremely wet weather over the last couple of weeks. Also, you can see in parts of uh, Texas, things have been quite dry, and in the northeast. So keep a close eye on this map because early this morning, this is from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., we can see where we were watching our storms, stretching from parts of uh, Michigan into Indiana, down into Kentucky and Tennessee, and a little pocket there in Illinois, some early morning thunderstorms. The remnants of the storms that came out of Minnesota still firing there, as you can see, moving over toward the northern part of the Mississippi watershed. And then in parts of central Kansas early this morning, some very heavy rainfall. But the thunderstorm complex I want to watch most carefully is the one that's coming out of this part of South Dakota. And the reason why is because the outflow of those storms, which this morning have been training, they've been following one another, producing some extremely heavy rainfall, where the outflow of those storms is likely going to be the main boundary on which we initiate some severe weather later today. So let's just fast forward this and pause it right here. Let me take you back. So this is through early this morning. Morning. So we can see the models were doing a decent job at finding these storms. Now what we're going to watch to see is if as we progress through 7, 8, 9, and this is now 10 a.m., if the storms will be able to continue to push through this particular part of Iowa. This is not a good time of day to get storms simply because the atmosphere is typically quite stable at 10 a.m., but it's very juicy right now with quite a bit of humidity. So we're going to see if these storms do survive the trip across Iowa, such that by 1 p.m. we're watching in this section of Iowa, right in through here, for a large complex of storms to initiate a large outflow boundary. So that's where the storms produce their own frontal boundary that races out ahead of them. That, if that happens, we will see that by early afternoon, possibly crossing the Mississippi River here, and then building into the evening hours afternoon and evening hours, a pretty sizable squalling that stretches from Lake Michigan here through parts of central Illinois. Now the boundary still lingers back into this area through parts of uh, Missouri, back into Kansas, here into the Panhandle. So we could watch for scattered storms along that boundary into this area as well. And also under the stagnant heat of the day down over the southeast, you can see the storms popping. As we go forward with this, this is now 5 p.m. Let's get toward 8 o'clock in the evening. Storms could stretch on the outflow of those uh, of the initial storms here in Iowa. Yeah, it could stretch clear from southern uh, Michigan through Ohio, Indiana, and cut all the way back over towards St. Louis. As we allow this to play forward into the evening hours, that thunderstorm complex could move all the way into the Ohio River Valley. Now remember, we have to watch to see how these storms initiate in Iowa later on today to understand if this is going to happen. So this is going to be a now cast situation as we allow these storms to really develop on the heat of the day progressing forward. But this is what the latest high resolution rapid refresh model picking up on. Now, since we're talking about strong winds as being the primary threat, I do want to deviate for a moment here and show you what we're anticipating in terms of accumulated maximum wind gusts throughout the next five days. And coming into parts of the Canadian prairies, we can see that with the storm track racing through that area, uh, we may possibly get have wind gusts at times that are in the 30 to 40 mile an hour range. And also in parts of the west, there is risk of fire over the next few days here and some stronger wind gusts under some drier conditions could keep those fires really going. So we'll keep a close eye on it. Now here comes the trickiest part of this forecast. First, I wanna show you what the National Weather Service is uh, predicting here over the next um, uh, seven days. Lots of scattered storms in this area, but no possible way on telling you beyond at least the next couple of days what the where the best probability of them being is. The models are struggling uh, with this pattern, which is focused more on Canada. Uh, and therefore, right here in the central part of the Corn Belt, uh, we are going to not be able to predict much beyond the next 24 hours what your thunderstorm situation is going to look like. Meanwhile, the stationary boundary that's kind of parked over here in the southeast, being fed on plenty of Gulf moisture and moisture out of the Atlantic, we expect to see quite a bit of thunderstorm activity stretching parts of Alabama, Georgia, Georgia, all the way through the Carolinas up into the mid-Atlantic. And we do have, with an active storm track coming through Canada, better chances of seeing heavier rainfall, as you can see here, in parts of Manitoba, uh, getting into parts of North Dakota and Minnesota. 
So this is the area over which I think I'm going to struggle the most with forecasting. I'm going to show you why. On the left, I have just through the next 72 hours, the GFS. And on the right, I have the European. You can already start to see some pretty sizable differences here. For example, look at this particular thunderstorm complex that GFS is trying to take off here on Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. If I was in South Dakota looking maybe at my radar app or my weather app, I, I wouldn't see anything on there if I had a European data feed. But the GFS puts down several inches of rainfall out of a thunderstorm complex. This is going to be the nature of the forecasting challenges over the next several days, probably weeks, as we get into this time period in late summer where the forecast of the pattern is hard because of how weak the upper level winds tend to be across the United States. This gets even worse when I take you out over the next five days. You see the European model after Tuesday wants to develop this cutoff low. It's interesting, this little Vortmax that comes racing right through this part of Iowa and then moves here and develops into a much larger system over parts of the Great Lakes. And the European has none of it. Can you see that? The European has, has none of that. But with that Canadian storm track, we at least get a bit more confident with some of the precipitation here. Unless, look at this, GFS in this part of North Dakota versus the European in that part of North Dakota. The difference is where the heaviest precip is going to be. So I'm, I'm sorry, but this is going to be a week where we're going to have to now cast our way through a day by day to see how the pattern sets up. If I had a place I was more confident about, it's going to be the daily scattered storms that are going to stretch across the southeast up to the mid-Atlantic. That's about it. That would be the place I would feel the most, most comfortable. I am going to show you the European model simply because it has, uh, I think, a pretty good handle on the upper level pattern, not precipitation, but the upper level pattern in the next five to seven days. And you can already see that starting off on Monday, look at the winds we're expecting here. See the tight gradient in the isobars? So here's the thunderstorm complex that's coming through in the overnight hours. This is early this morning, so we expect it to be somewhere in this vicinity, and we can still see the scattered nature of the storms over Illinois early this morning. Let's play this forward, and let me show you what the models are picking up on from there. Monday afternoon and evening, this is where we're watching again, coming out of eastern Iowa to northern Illinois, our thunderstorm threat. But all along that weak frontal boundary here, we could see storms, remember? Now over the southeast, this is just popping on the heat of the day. From there, let's go into the overnight hours on Monday night to Tuesday morning, and then into Tuesday midday. So sorry, there's Tuesday morning, Tuesday midday. So what we end up getting here is still kind of a lingering boundary sitting in this area. Storms popping again on the heat over the southeast, but there's nothing allowing that boundary to push much farther to the south. Now here's the interesting feature that shows up, like I said, after Tuesday in the European. See it right here? The European zero Z run wants to produce this very interesting boundary, or excuse me, outflow that comes from a complex of storms that pushes again right through this area of Missouri, parts of Iowa over in Illinois. Did you see it? If we go back here again, this is Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, and evening, right in through there, all around this higher atmospheric pressure sitting here over the Great Lakes. And as we get toward the end of the week, this is now Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, and evening, and now working our way into Friday morning. And this is where the European model has created a very interesting feature coming through parts of Iowa and Missouri. It's nowhere else. It's not even in the ensembles, but they're just kicking this feature off and taking it right across Illinois as a deep little low and then into Michigan. And who knows if that thing's going to show up? I certainly don't think it will, but it's there in the forecast. What is consistent is the systems coming through Canada throughout this week. And that's where our main storm track seems to kind of lie at this particular point. So there's no point in looking at this map out beyond about the next five days. So we're going to look at it a little bit differently. Over here on the left, I have the GFS. Over here on the right, I have the European. This is just through the next week, the probability of getting an inch of rainfall. So what we can see here is maybe just a little bit better idea of where the stormiest pattern is going to be. But notice again how large of a discrepancy over the next seven days the European Ensemble and the GFS Ensemble have in terms of precipitation amounts. Very maddening. Here's something cool, though. I was watching last week. GFS got a major upgrade. We've now got more Ensemble members. I'll be working on that this week and present it to you in the uh, long range that will come out on Wednesday. As we think about to the end of this week, look at the daisy chain of low-pressure systems uh, that are coming out of like the Aleutian Islands and Alaska going across Canada. You can see them. There's one, two, three. We can then see our subtropical highs. Ready? One, two, three, four. 
And then south of that, look, one, two, three tropical systems. So by the end of the week, the atmosphere is all spun up into a lot of these smaller eddies. But you can't argue with the stronger flow that's coming here out of the North Pacific. That is our increasing uh, momentum that's been coming out of the North Pacific. It's going to keep that Canadian storm track quite active. So if you kind of notice at this particular point, you, you can see the flow coming right in through here, cranking. And that's why when we look out here just between uh, the next four to seven days, so this is day four through day seven. So it's good. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. This is a uh, day four through day 10, a seven day forecast. We can see this Canadian storm track keeping things very wet in this quarter. See it? And then high pressure cells sitting here. Storms are going to come around that down into that area. And it's all going to kind of sit over here in the southeast where I'm expecting yet another week of very, very wet conditions in that area. Okay, let's keep pressing on here and let's now talk about temperatures. By day 10, the operational European model, keeping a deep trough in the Gulf of Alaska, a deep trough between the northeast and the Hudson Bay, and a large ridge sitting right here over the four corners. The ensemble has a similar pattern, but it's a bit more washed out. Can you see that? It doesn't quite have the depth of this trough in the European ensemble. But let's go from there to the GFS. Now you're going, wait a minute, I don't see too much of a difference, but the difference is what's going to be happening here in the eastern half of North America. All the models want to do is put that ridge over the southeast and keep some sort of trough in this area. But it's what they end up doing with the downstream flow that's quite challenging to figure out. Now, I think we need to watch what that does in terms of temperatures first. Today, what are we watching? Well, in the west, there's just a lot of uh, potential for the, these high base thunderstorms produce quite a bit of lightning. And with some of the stronger winds and drier conditions near the surface, there's a fire threat. We have heat advisories that have stretched here from parts of Oklahoma to Arkansas, then up the Mississippi River. Same thing in parts of the northeast. And that was because at 340 this morning, look at the temperatures. We have 80 degree weather already sitting in this area, and it's even hotter than that farther to the south. It's going to be juicy. We can see that by this evening, very high precipitable water amounts that stretch clear up here to, to northern Iowa, stretching through Michigan and back over into the central plains. That very high precipitable water is going to be the source of the very uh, high heat index values today. But there's our boundary that we can see here today on which we're going to watch our thunderstorms form. So you're looking now at high temperatures today. Let's play this forward and see how things evolve throughout the week. So from Monday into Tuesday, we can then see the effect of the storms into this part of the country, maybe keeping things a little bit cooler, but warm all along its periphery compared to normal. Meanwhile, the west coast of the United States, especially the Pacific Northwest, sees another bit of cooler weather as those troughs keep digging in. From the south central plains stretching up into the parts of the Canadian prairies and then back here over to the Great Lakes, warmer than average temperatures. A lot of temperatures cranking up into the low to mid 90s here and then getting into the high 90s and triple digits down into parts of Texas. From Wednesday into Thursday, and then Thursday into Friday, as we work our way in toward the weekend, this is where the ridge becomes more established out west, and the flow comes around it just like this, and you can see uh, possibly some near average, slightly cooler than average weather on Saturday. So from there, what about day six through 10? Well, both models are keying in on that ridge in the west. See it? But they still have systems digging in to the northwest. So there's the cooler weather. So what happens downstream? Remember, this is the area that we have our greatest question about moving forward. We see the models are trying to keep temperatures possibly near average in that area. Day 11 through 15, models are building the heat here, right? Still more troughs coming into the northwest. The European ensemble being a bit flatter pattern has much closer to normal temperatures here. The GFS is only kicking off the cooler weather just due to more scattered storms. More cloud cover prevents it from getting too hot in the day. From there, let's finish this up by talking tropics quickly. We have a wave we are going to be watching over the next few days here develop in the main development region. Um, European models giving it about a 70% chance of developing. The National Hurricane Center about a 60% chance of developing. So we do have something to watch there very carefully. I think for the rest of this month and into September, if the MJO does come back over here to phase eight and one, it means that this whole part of the tropics is very conducive to vertical development. So we're just gonna have to watch out for the upper levels of the atmosphere, making it more easy for tropical cyclones to form. And I'll finish with a quick international perspective, very hot week here in parts of this section of Europe, but cooler over in the Russian wheat belt over toward Ukraine as well. And as we take a look at what's going on with our flooding situation in China, another 10 days in the forest, 
forecast here, we can see that the northern and western parts of the drainage here that goes into the Yangtze River continue to see extremely heavy rainfall. So that flooding problem is not going away anytime soon. And the Indian monsoon is cranking right now. I hope you found this as a good way to start your week and informative. Have a good one. I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning with our regional updates at my.nutrientagsolutions.com. Thanks.